the sound of the bell remind us that the Spirit of God is within us and among us. Well, good morning, all. Uh, most of you know that I'm Jerry Copeman, which means that Ryan is away, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you and to wish you a happy Easter. Uh, we're continuing in the Easter season, and today is, of course, the second Sunday of Easter. I wasn't here last week to uh, wish you that, but uh, I was over at All People's, and we celebrated well there. All of us are welcome in this place. It is God's place and it is our place. And as such, all are children of God and all have value. And so we celebrate that the risen Lord makes a place for us with him, in him, and that we continue to make him present through our lives. And would you join together in the acknowledgement of the territory? We acknowledge that we worship in the traditional territory of the Atekmakshin and Ashnabic people. As we gather today, we recognize those traditional stewards. And come here, great power. We acknowledge that our history has come at a great cost to indigenous people. And we commit ourselves community of faith and the treaty people within the Robinson Treaty of 1850 to learn how we can support healing and reconciliation. So I'm sure that there are announcements and uh, stories to be told about the life of the congregation. This is a good time to do all of that. Good morning, Mary Ferris from UCW. Just to let you know that due to the eclipse happening tomorrow, uh, the UCW meeting has been canceled. We were going to have the rising stars perform, but they're not feeling comfortable in coming and going as well as we want to keep our members safe. So we will carry on our regular meeting in May. Thank you. So just a reminder about the Earth Day cleanup, which is on Saturday, April the 20th, two days before Earth Day. Um, there are, it's arrival at the church at 10. There are different routes set out, and there's routes for all ages. So we've got some that will be good for littler people, some that are braver and are willing to go up and down Regent Street. Um, if you have gardening gloves, those are good to bring. We do have some cotton gloves provided by the city, but gardening gloves are actually much better. And they are only adult sizes, so if any little ones are coming and they've got some smaller gloves, that would be excellent. Um, and there will be some treats provided afterwards for everyone. Good morning, everyone. Mary Ann Roscoe, Chair of Finance. 17 days. That's not a lot of time. It's 17 days till Thursday, April 25, when we shift into high gear of day one of the yard sale. On that Thursday, we need muscle, tables from storage to be set up in Heritage and Fellowship Hall this year, and the field house, and again on Saturday after the sale to put them back. On that Thursday, we also open boxes and we start set up for display. On Friday, we continue set up and we do pricing. Saturday is the big day. It is intense, it is crazy, and it's a whole lot of fun. Now, do you know 
how many volunteers are needed to set up. 30 plus each day. How many on sale day? 54. We are veterans when it comes to setting up yard sales. We're professionals. All of us centers on us as volunteers. Your request for participation in On the Rock and to pass volunteers by an email sent by Richard last week has not generated a lot of response. <coughs> is it a lot of work? You bet it is. I'm asking you to please, in the next couple of days, respond to that email sent to you by Richard and say, yes, I'll help. We're going to call you. Be ready. For sale day on Saturday, it's highly preferable for you to be there from 8.30 to 2.30 rather than for a few hours. All contributions of your time, however, are gratefully accepted. If you haven't participated as a volunteer before, give it serious thought and be in touch with me or Richard for information. Ask your friends and family to help. And don't forget, like I said, we're going to call you. There was a survey conducted last fall after the yard sale, and folks volunteered because it's fun and fellowship. It helps others in the community. It helps our church financially, among so many other positive comments that were received. This time, 20% of the net proceeds given to MNS to support other charities as they so choose. The success of yard sales rests on the shoulders of the women of UCW. They donated proceeds to many charities, and now so will we. Watch on the Rock, April 10, 17, and 24, for updates on where help is needed. Thank you. Let's join together in our spiritual focus. In this Easter season, we celebrate resurrection, a renewal of hope for our world, the promise of new beginnings, the music of gladness, and with that in mind, let's sing together hymn number 177.
the lighting of the Christ candle is responsive this morning, and so we join together. We gather as a community of seekers, seeking light and direction, a light that will open our minds and warm our hearts, a light that will guide our way. May this candle, which we burn today, remind us of the truth revealed in the life and love of Jesus and inspire us to walk in his way. When I came into the uh, sanctuary this morning, I noticed that the uh, rainbow colors have been moved from the communion table over to the choir, and it's good to see that they are still here, because it reminds us of who we are as a congregation. And I think it's important for us to uh, remind ourselves that we are not a welcoming community, but an affirming community. Welcoming means that anybody is welcome to just wander in and plunk himself down. But an affirming com community says who you are is important and we value you, we respect you, and we would like to use your gifts as well. So you are indeed affirmed along with being welcomed in this holy place. Leslie will lead us in our prayer of the day. reminded me today that I'm a monk's friend. Yes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was going to say a friend reminded me this morning that I'm among friends and that I shouldn't be nervous. It's just I haven't done this in a couple of years. So. Uh, please join me in our prayer of the day. God alive and among us this day, to you no door is closed, no heart locked. Draw us beyond our doubts and fears until we discover the meaning of resurrection and with confidence say, we believe. Amen. Which one do you want to say? Let us sing voices in the night, 396. 396, Jesus stand among us. Thank you. prepare to hear the word that has been assigned for our reflection today. Let's open ourselves, mind, heart, and spirit to welcome the message and to try as best we can to make sense of it. And let's join in prayer, prayer of transformation, prayer for new life. Giver of life, come to us and speak words of comfort and challenge. Come to us with life-giving power, that we might be inspired by your word, 
boldly live our faith and transform our world with love. So we have time for the young and the young at heart. <coughs> we have one young, <laughs> Kai, <laughs> and the rest of us are wannabes. <laughs> Kai, do you want to come and join me or you can stay there with Jillian, whatever you like, dear. You want to stay there? That's okay. All right. <coughs> I want you to think a little bit about uh, Easter and about Christmas because two things happen Easter and Christmas that don't happen every other day besides the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday the Easter Bunny also comes that's a once in a year experience and if the kids were gathered around with me, I would ask them, and so I ask you, what signs are there that the Easter Bunny has come? How do we know the Easter Bunny came? Chocolates? I, I have bad hearing, so just pretend that I hear you. <laughs> Chocolates, somebody say Easter eggs? And when Santa Claus comes, how do we know Santa Claus came? Presents under the tree. Yeah. Cookies are gone. Cookies? <laughs> Cookies are gone. Yeah. And the rainbow probably ate the carrots. And yeah. Easter bunnies and Santa Claus leave tangible signs that they were there. But that isn't the case with Jesus. How do we know that Jesus was raised to new life on Easter day? What signs are there that he is alive? There are no little eggs. There are no presents under a tree. How do you know? How do I know that Jesus actually was raised from the dead? Well, in my sermon this morning, I'm going to try to make sense out of that question <laughs> because it's an important one. We are Christian people and we stand in the midst of our secular world and we say, well, we have faith in one who was crucified and is now alive. And modern people are looking at us and saying, what proof do you have of that? Or are you just holding on to an old story because that's the way you were raised? I think we have to ask ourselves very seriously, how do we know that Jesus is alive? And then, how do we proclaim that to our world in a way that the world can believe us? We don't got Easter eggs and we don't got presents under a tree. So what do we have to show that we are believers and we have experienced the risen Lord? So pay attention to the readings that have been assigned for us, and hopefully my reflection today will help to provide us with something that we can take home and think about. First scripture reading today is from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. 
Now the whole group of those who believed were on were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Second scripture, John chapter 20, 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, sorry, he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Herein lies the word of the Lord. I'm going to stand behind the flowers this morning so that um, I can sort of add some festivity to my thinking as I continue the question that I posed to us in the time for the young at heart. How do we know that Jesus was raised from the dead? 
And more importantly, I think, not only how do we know it, how do we believe it, but how do we share that belief with others in a way that is credible? As I was preparing my reflection, I stumbled across a commentary, an opinion piece, in the Toronto Star of um, the Friday edition, Friday, April the 5th, written by Andrew Phillips. And the headline caught my eye because it says, there is a reason we ignore the facts. So I was interested to discover what he had to say about ignoring facts. And here's what he writes. I've been thinking a lot about thinking, about how we come to believe what we believe and the tendency of people to cling to their beliefs in the face of a mountain of facts that contradict those same beliefs. This is hardly a new issue. We've been lamenting the fact that people lock themselves into self-reinforcing communities of belief for years now, especially since the advent of Donald Trump and his world of alternative facts. Cognitive scientists suggest to us, they maintain that the human brain simply isn't built for individual rational thinking about anything. Instead, they argue, humans evolve to think in groups. Thinking is a social process. Group cooperation and group loyalty was our species' crucial advantage for survival. And we haven't really evolved past that even though our society and technology are light years from our Stone Age origins. This isn't some fringe theory. It's in line with decades of research into why humans believe what they believe, and the implications are enormous. We are not to state the most obvious point, freestanding rational actors who weigh the facts on every issue and draw our own conclusions. No one could do that. And in fact, we are hardwired to adopt the beliefs of those around us, the group that gives our identity and which once upon a time we depended for our very survival. We believe in spite of the fact that there are mountains of evidence that what we believe doesn't make sense. I thought it was an important piece to reflect upon as we try to make sense out of the story of the resurrection of Jesus and how we reflect today on poor old Thomas, Thomas who gets a bad rap because he wanted a tangible experience that Jesus was indeed alive. When we hear the story of Thomas and Jesus appearing to the apostles and disciples in the locked away room, we as a group, as a community, have down through the ages taken it as something true that the apostles and disciples were locked away for fear of the authorities, and Jesus physically appeared to them. Not quite the way he was before he was crucified, because after all, he did come through the wall. But he nonetheless was there in such a way that people could reach out and touch him. For centuries. We've believed that and we've proclaimed that. In spite of the mounting evidence around us that it's quite impossible 
for someone to be raised out of a tomb, walk through a wall, and then have someone reach out and touch him. What we don't take into consideration, I suggest, is that that particular story was written in an historical time when it was common for people to believe that dead people like Jesus had indeed been buried. From 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, the 16th verse, we hear this written by Paul. And Paul's writing, of course, preceded the writing of the Thomas story. So this is what people believed at the time that the story of Thomas was written. For the Lord himself with a cry of command and with the archangel's call and with the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. That's a story of the return of Jesus at the end of time. And what's going to happen when Jesus returns at the end of time, according to Paul in the letter to the Thessalonians? The dead will come out of their tombs. They'll be raised up. Because after all, dead people were buried. In spite of the mounting evidence around us, we still talk that language as if we bury dead people. And we talk that language and therefore we can say with confidence each Easter day, Jesus was raised from the tomb because shortly after his crucifixion, he was buried in a tomb. That's what people believed. They buried the dead. In Matthew, the 27th chapter, beginning at the 50th verse, we read, Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. And the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. They believed that people who died were buried in anticipation of one day being freed from the tomb. And so it was normal for them on Easter day to tell the story that Jesus was alive and they tell the story by saying, well, he wasn't in the tomb. He came out of the tomb because that's what people who are resurrected do. They come out of the tomb. And Jesus, who came out of the tomb, appears to the apostles and disciples in the upper room. And poor Thomas says, well, you're out of your mind. Unless I can touch him, I'm not going to believe. Because Thomas believed in what had been taught down through the centuries before him, that people who died get buried. And one day they would be raised up when God decided that it was time. And for Jesus, that raising up day was three days after he was put into the tomb. The truth that we should understand in the context of our modern information, our modern scientific understanding of the human body and all bodies, is that it is impossible to bury people. The tomb on Easter Sunday was empty because Jesus was never in the tomb. His body was in the tomb 
but we don't bury people. You know that and I know that today from scientific truth. After preaching a, a sermon at a funeral a few years ago at the uh, cooperative funeral home, I was walking out to my car, and I may have told you this, when a neuroscientist came running after me. And he said, what you said in the chapel is so true. I'm a neuroscientist, he said. I see energy inside of people's bodies. And when their bodies die, that energy has to continue. You can't kill energy. We bury bodies. We cremate bodies. But we don't bury people, nor do we cremate them. And yet, because of how we preach in our churches and in our funeral home chapels, we oftentimes tell people that we do. After preaching another sermon, I remember speaking with an elderly gentleman whose wife had passed and whose funeral we had just celebrated. And I said to him, well, of course you'll know we're not going to cremate your wife. Well, he said, I paid for it. I said, we're not going to cremate your wife. I don't think she would want to be cremated. We will respectfully cremate her body, but we will not be cremating her. The way we have taught people in our theological misinterpretations of the story, regardless of our modern sci scientific way of thinking, continues to reinforce within them that the physical resurrection of Jesus and his appearing to the apostles and disciples in the upper room was an actual fact, when what it is is historically for their time, the writers were trying to say, this is what happened. Jesus was alive. And the only way they could describe it is by saying, well, you could touch him because you got out of the tomb, because that's what dead people are going to do one day, because they were buried. Well, we know that they're not buried. They are energy. You are energy. And I'll be cremated. No, I won't. My body will be. But when I die, my energy has to continue. And I will be there for my loved ones. And they'll find me when they remember the things that I used to love to do. And they'll find me in the places that I love to go. Because I will be always with them. Because St. John, in spite of himself in the first letter, says... When we die, we become just like God. Our energy continues to live. I oftentimes smile when I read obituaries and hear people say, well, of course, we know that Dad's now up in the sky looking down upon us. Even better, he's up there playing golf or having a beer with his friends. And I'm reminded when I hear those kind of things and read them of Bishop Spong, one of my favorite authors, writing in Why Christianity Must Change or Die, that if Jesus was physically resurrected and physically ascended into heaven, in today's scientific understanding of things, he'd still be orbiting the planet because it takes a lot of propulsion to break through the atmosphere and get away from gravity. What we know scientifically to be true, what we live in our real world, has to come into our churches. We have to speak in terms that make sense. Is it any wonder that our churches are empty? Is it any wonder that people think we're crazy when we preach based on the old way of thinking? that we know is scientifically not true. Eckhart Tolle, the contemporary author, says to us, you don't have a life, because if you had a life, you could lose your life. But you are life. 
And because you are life, you cannot lose your life. You cannot die. Jesus didn't die. His body was crucified. It died, but not Jesus. They took his body and put it in a tomb. But that wasn't Jesus. Any more than when we bury you or they bury me, we'll be stuck in the tomb. God, I, I was at a funeral home a few years ago. And it was in the afternoon, and the, one of the church groups was having a celebration in anticipation of the funeral the next day. And the final prayer that was read about this woman who died, and we ask you, O oh God, to raise her up on the last day. I said, oh, for God's sakes. They're going to put her in the ground, and she's going to sit around there or lie around there, hopefully in a comfortable coffin, until the last day comes. It doesn't make sense. But it's the language of the church in some churches and some preachers, hopefully not mine. So how do we speak about the resurrection today? How do we tell people that it's true that he is still with us, that his energy is not only around us, but in us as well? The energy is, of course, a verb, not a noun. It's not something to be touched, like an Easter egg or a Christmas present. It's energy that is inspiring. And interestingly enough, the answer to the question is found in the scriptures. It was read for us this morning. How do we proclaim to a modern world what the resurrection means if it doesn't mean that we can touch the risen Lord as Thomas wanted to? It's found in the Acts of the Apostles. And this is what St. Luke wrote. The whole group of those who believed are of one heart and soul. No one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. How did they do it? There was not a needy person among them, for as many owned lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, laid them at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each of them who had need. How do we proclaim the resurrection today? When we remember, might I suggest, that the reason for Jesus' presence in our world was to help transform the world into the dream that God had for the garden. The story of the book of Genesis that we read as a literal thing never happened. It's a poetic understanding of the dream of what should be and what will be. And Jesus came to help cultivate the garden a garden in which all humankind and all creation together could share in the bounty of God's life and God's creation and God's gift to us. How do people understand that we believe in the risen Lord? By living the risen Lord. By being ones not who touch him, but who breathe him in. Not ones who, like Thomas, say, you're outside of me, Jesus, I want to make sure that you're there but rather I believe that you are energy, that you always were, that when your body ceased to hold on to that energy, it was released. And I have breathed it in and it emerges with my energy and I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. It's what scripture says. That's what resurrection is supposed to mean. We live now, not ourselves, selfishly and independently, but we live now 
as Christ working in common for the coming of the reign of God. Going to end nowadays. <laughs> Dave was asking me how long I was going to preach because he has to plug in the coffee maker. John Lennon understood it. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Imagine all the people sharing for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. No religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. That's how we show that Jesus is alive. That's how we show we believe. Not an int intellectual, creedal statement, but an energy that inspires and transforms us to be the agents through which the dream of God becomes a reality. And as Bishop Spong would say in that book that I quoted earlier, if Christianity doesn't change, it will die. going to sing together hymn number 185, and uh, it's all about telling that the Lord is risen, and let's see how it was written, and whether it connects with our modern way of thinking. So, sing along, read along, and let's enjoy.
that we might be tempted to say, well, that sort of contradicts what I was saying. But it's not true. But till I touch his very flesh, I will not trust your joy. What we need to understand is that you and I are that flesh. We are where the risen Lord is to be found. And people who want to experience him need only experience us if we live his love, his forgiveness, his welcome, his affirming. We are what Thomas was looking for, the body of Christ alive in our world. And so, friends, we come to our time for offering, and we know that our offering helps to proclaim the work of the church and sustain it, and so let's be generous. Together, let's pray the prayer of dedication. You, O God, are the Easter One, the holy source of resurrection. With gratitude for hope renewed and the promise of eternal life, we offer these gifts. friends, we turn our hearts once more to the presence of the divine with us and in us. And we recognize that often that for which we pray, we are asking for the courage to make it happen. And so we pray, Creator God, we believe that your Son Jesus is alive and has been freed from the power of physical death. Help us today to understand that his resurrection is a foretaste of ours as well, that death cannot conquer us, that death is not the end of the journey, that our pilgrimage is not from birth to dying, but from birth to becoming, becoming ever more like you, O oh God loving, healing, forgiving. We gather to celebrate the great triumphs of Jesus rising. We ask you to help us to make it the model for our living. We acknowledge, O oh God, that for us to truly be alive as Jesus is, there are things that we need to let go of. We acknowledge that for us to live as did the early church, one heart, one mind, a common purpose, that we need to let go of harmful relationships, to divest ourselves of tired habits, put aside fruitless longings, to 
be generous with our possessions. We ask you, O God, to resurrect in our lives faith, hope, and love. Just as surely as you raise Jesus to new life, raise us as well and help us to live and love as he did and so be one with you now and forever. And we've been asked to pray for Heather, Louise, Murray, and Peggy, for Holly and Mike, for Juan's family, to pray for Pat and family, for Dev, Katie, Bob, and Reha, for John and for Lise, for the Bertram family, to remember today Myra, Linda, Keith and Alan, John and Connie, Elaine, Curtis, and Ryan. We pray for Jan and Alan Bowles, for Heather and Natalie, as we do for Elwood and Marilyn, Wade, Diane, Nicholas, Carly and Tia, John and Sue. We pray, O oh God, for Alan and Joan and Holly and family, on Sue and her family, Melissa and her family, for Neva, Dan, Jason, and Blaze. We pray too, O oh God, in thanksgiving for our family, for our friends near and far, and of course we are grateful for warmer weather. And for our world, O oh God, we pray for peace. And especially we pray that there may indeed be peacemakers who allow their bodies to be the instruments for your work and your love. We pray for food and education for all children. We pray that all may have enough and that all of us may enjoy the peace that is your dream when your reign, O God, becomes truly manifest in our world. And we bring all our prayers together, praying as Jesus taught us. Creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So we sing together hymn number 186, Now the Green Blade Rises, 186.
friends, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you. And I hope you'll uh, take some of that home with you and continue to ponder the meaning of resurrection and how we, indeed, are the ones that can be touched to prove that the risen Lord is still alive. God of Easter, send us forth to imagine the power of resurrection and all creation might become one. Inspired by the living Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and praise forever. And so we go forth in the name of the God who makes us, in the name of the Christ who makes us free, in the name of the Spirit who makes us one, proclaiming Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. Amen.